Here are some reminders to help you get the most out of your Dive CD lessons. First, work the problems with me. Work every single problem that I work and take notes on everything that I write on the board. One thing I encourage you to do is on the first practice problem, work that one with me, but then for the second and subsequent ones, pause the CD, try to work the problem on your own, then fast forward to the answer. If you got it right, great, you can move on to the next one. If you got it wrong, rewind the CD, look at how to pro solve the problem, and figure out how to do it correctly. Next, anytime you need to, pause and rewind the CD until you understand that particular concept. The ability to pause and rewind so easily is what makes Dive CD lessons so much better than a live classroom lecture, so make sure and take advantage of that technology. Next, remember the purpose of math is to teach you to think and to solve problems, to effectively and efficiently think and solve problems. In the lower math levels, there's lots of mental math. In the upper levels especially, this is the most important purpose of math is to teach you to think and to solve problems. Next, do all of the problems in the problem sets. It depends on the course that you're doing, but typically you'll do three to five problem sets a week, so that means three to five CD lessons plus a test. Next, work the homework problems and your test problems too. Work those vertically. Split your paper in two and work them vertically. And of course, make sure you show your work on your problems too. As you work them vertically, write each step down and write each subsequent step underneath the previous one. And this will help you sometimes to recognize patterns a little bit easier and help you solve the problem better. Also use a calculator sparingly. Only for geometry problems and some word problems. Don't use it for math 7, 6 or below that for, for any of that. Algebra half and up, use it sparingly. And lastly, have a good attitude. Every day you do school, you have a choice to make. It is your personal choice to have a good attitude, work hard, do your best, or to be lazy, complain, whine, and have a bad attitude. So choose right now to have a good attitude. Dive in, take advantage of this CD lesson, and do your best to learn the math that you're going to learn today. Lesson A is a review lesson as well as Lesson B and in these lessons everything that you will see should be a review from the Algebra 1 textbook. Now if you did not use a Saxon textbook for Algebra 1 some of these items may be new items so I'll try to explain them clearly. Remember your goal is to write down everything I write down and work all the problems that I work so let's go ahead and get started. So let's review these terms point, curve, line, line segment, ray, and plane. A point, if we drew a point on the paper there, that's just describing a specific location. Now some of these are kind of weird concepts like a mathematical point. It really has no size. We draw a dot on our paper to locate the point or to identify the location of that particular point. But mathematically speaking, it really has no size to it at all. A curve, that can be thought of as a connection of points. But since points, mathematically speaking, have no size, they can't really be connected, we can think of a curve as a point that is moving. And so this could be considered a curve, or this could be considered a curve as well. So a curve is thought of as an unbroken connection of points, or just a point that is moving, and the path that that movement takes. Now, a curve that's straight, that's what a line is. And again, we really can't identify the location of a line, mathematically speaking, because it has no width and we can't tell where it ends. That's what we put the arrows on the end for is to say that it continues to the left and to the right forever. We draw a line with our pencil and pen to locate the mathematical line, to show its location. A line segment, that would be a part of a line. And we just draw a line and we put dots on the end. And those dots represent that we are just saying from the left dot to the right dot is the distance of the line segment or the length of it. Now we could also give the line segment a name. For example, we could put an X at this point and a Y at that point. And we could call that line segment X 
y. And we just put a bar over that and say line segment x, y. Now we could also call it line segment y, x. We could have written the y first and the x second. It does not matter. It's still a line segment. Likewise on a line, we could do the same thing on a line. And you have to have at least two points to define a line. That's an important thing to understand about lines. You have to have at least two points to define a line. I mean, think about it. If you put a point up here, you could draw one, two, three, four. You could draw an infinite number of lines through that point. But if you put two points, there's one and only one line that can go through those two points. So you need at least two points to identify a line. Now we could put another point on here and just call it point Z. And we could say that that line is line X, Y. That would be one way to name it or identify it. And we put a little bar with arrows on the ends. That makes it, helps us remember that we're talking about a line and not a line segment now. Or we could also call it line segment X, Z. That's another name we could give it. Or line X, Z, not line segment. And then also line Y, Z, line Z, Y, line Z, X. All we have to do is have two points that lie on that line. That's how we can identify it. Now, array, that's basically half of a line. We put a dot to show an end like a line segment has. And then we put an arrow on the other end. And we call that array. Now, we could name that ray with at least two points on it. And so we could call that ray x, y. We put an arrow like that. Now we could not say ray yx. That would not work. You can't do this. Because you always start from the dot, basically. That's, you say that's the beginning and then the arrow is the ending point. And so we always have to write it down like that as well. We can't say ray yx because the y is at the end. The letter closest to the starting point or closest to the dot that's the one you always write first when you're defining a ray. Now a plane, that's just a two-dimensional boundary or flat surface. And so like a sheet of paper basically is a way of thinking about a plane. Now a piece of paper does have thickness though. But that's an, a good example of a plane. Now, mathematically speaking, a plane has no boundaries, no thickness to it. And so really it's going on in all these directions forever and ever. We just have to draw a shape to represent where it lies. Now the location of a plane, that can be identified or defined in several ways. And you can talk about intersecting or non-intersecting lines to define a plane. One way to define a plane is by two parallel lines. And so you could draw a pair of parallel lines. And if those two lie on that plane that I've drawn there, then by definition that plane is defined or can be defined by those two parallel lines. Another way is intersecting lines. A plane can be defined by two intersecting lines. Now every line can be defined by two points, right? So if we had a point on this one and a point on this one, they have this point, this intersection point in common. So those two intersecting lines can be identified by three points. Therefore, a plane can be identified by three points as well. So remember what these definitions are. Point, curve, line, line segment, ray, and plane. Now let's talk about angles, and again, we'll have a bunch of different definitions that you'll need to know. Now angles, those are identified by two rays that have a common endpoint. So that would be an example of an angle there. Two rays, they both have an endpoint in common. Now there are several types of angles that are important to remember. If you have two rays that have a common endpoint and one goes to the right, one goes to the left, 
that's considered a straight angle. Now if you have two rays, one goes to the right, one goes perpendicular to it, so that means like a 90 degree angle, that's considered a right angle. And then if you have two rays like the one at the top, that's considered an acute angle. And then two rays like this, one to the right, and then the other goes out greater than 90 degrees, that's considered an obtuse angle. Now it should be noted here that a straight angle, that's basically two right angles that are back to back. And so you could think about it like that. The measure of an angle, that's figured out using what's called a protractor. And you place a protractor right there at the intersection of the two um, points of the rays. And the protractor has marks on it that you can figure out the measure of an angle. Like for that acute angle, we can put a little mark there and say, 32 and we put a little circle, that's our degree symbol. We'd say that the measure of that acute angle is 32 degrees. The measure of a right angle is always equal to 90 degrees. Any right angle is always 90 degrees. And so that means the measure of a straight angle, and we would say from here over to here, that's 180 degrees because it's two right angles. Now some other interesting relationships with angles are for a circle. Say so you had a circle and it has a center. Think about it, you could break that up into four quarters. And if you follow that around, you'd see how many degrees there were in a circle. Start here at the right horizontal segment and you go up 90, 180, 270, 360. Four 90 degree angles are included inside there. And so there are 360 degrees in a circle. And then one other type of angle that's not talked about a whole lot is called a reflex angle. Let's say you had a straight. It's like greater than a straight angle. So just compare it to that straight angle to the left. You see it's greater than that. And so when we measure a reflex angle, we start at an initial position. And we'd measure all the way over to there. And we'd see that that terminal position from the initial to the terminal position, those are just names that are given when you're measuring an angle, that would be greater than 180 degrees. Acute angles are less than 90. Straight angles are equal to 180. Right angles are equal to 90 degrees. Obtuse are greater than 90 degrees. Now a lot of times we're looking at angles that are in combinations. And so, for example, let's say we had this angle and then we had another ray also that had a common endpoint with the first two rays that we drew. We can name each of those individual rays as well. We could call all of their endpoints A. We could say this is B, so that'd be ray AB, this would be ray AC, and this would be ray AD. And so the angle, we could say, that the big outside angle was angle DAB or angle BAD. And let's just write it like this, angle DAB. Now it's real important that you always write the end point in the middle. Because the middle letter is always by definition for an angle, in naming an angle, that's the middle letter. The end point is the middle letter. Now we would consider angle DAC and angle CAB to be adjacent angles. They both have a ray in common, basically. So angle DAC and angle CAB, we could say that they are adjacent angles. And so that's a, a special name that we give for angles like that. They have a common ray. Now let's talk about two special types of adjacent angles. And those have to deal with right angles and straight angles, basically. And so let's draw two straight angles here. And then let's draw a ray right here that is 
going to break up that 90 degree angle. We can tell that those are 90 degree angles because I'll put a little box on the corner. And when you're doing your lessons, anytime you see that box on the corner, that tells you that you have a right angle at that location. So if we have a right angle on the left, then we've got one on the right as well. Now we could draw two adjacent angles on the right. We could call this one A and this one angle B. And those would add up to 90 degrees. We would say angle A plus angle B equals 90 degrees. Now notice this time we didn't identify points on the rays to identify the lines. Supposedly that's a typical thing that is found in United States textbooks is that angles are defined by the points on the rays. European textbooks they identify angles by the space in between them. So there's basically two ways to do it. Here we're identifying the angles by the space in between them and we're calling one angle A and the other angle B. Those are considered complementary angles when the two angles add up to 90 degrees. So complementary angles are a type of adjacent angle pair where the two angles add up to 90 degrees. Now let's talk about another type of adjacent angle combination. And let's say you had this relationship here. This was angle A, that's an acute angle, and then an obtuse angle, angle B. You should be able to recognize that those two would add up to 180 degrees. And so we could write angle A plus angle B equals 180 degrees. Those are called supplementary angles. Supplementary angles add up to 180 degrees. Try to remember those definitions, complementary and supplementary. A lot of times what I like to do when I have a pair of relationships like this, memorize one of them really good and then you can kind of by default remember what the other one is. So if you remember really well that a complementary angle set is a pair of adjacent angles that add up to 90, then by default you can remember that supplementary, those are the ones that add up to 180. So memorize one of them really good. So when rays have common endpoints, we can end up with adjacent angles. And two important adjacent angle pairs to remember are complementary and supplementary. Now we can also have some interesting angle relationships when we have lines that intersect. And it just so happens here that say we call that angle A and angle B, angle A would equal angle B. And then if we had called this one C and this one D, angle C would equal angle D. And so there's an interesting relationship as well. So those are called vertical angles. Angle A equals angle B. Angle C equals angle D. The confusing thing about naming them vertical angles is angle C is to the right of angle D. It's not like it's above angle D or something, like it's vertical to it. So just remember that name though. Vertical means opposite angles when you're talking about angles. Opposite angles are equal when you have intersecting lines like that. Opposite angles are equal. Adjacent angles, those would add up to 180 degrees, right? So that's something else we can see here when we have intersecting lines. For example, if we start where angle A is, start at this initial ray, and go over to this terminal side over there, we would see a sum of 180 degrees. Angle A plus C equals 180. C plus B equals 180 as well, as well as D plus B, and then D plus A. Those pairs all add up to 180. So there's another combination that happens in intersecting lines. You get several supplementary angles as well as two pairs of vertical or opposite angles which are equal. Let's do a couple of practice problems now. Look at that setup there with the angles. I want you to tell me what angle X would equal. Well, you should recognize that you have complementary angles there. They add up to 90 degrees. And I'll put a little box on that left corner there to represent that those are def indeed right angles that are intersecting or that those line segments are intersecting at right angles. So that we know those add up to 90 degrees. 
and therefore we could just say 57 plus x equals 90 degrees and then to review our algebra we would just use our addition rule or additive property of equality and we would add a negative 57 to both sides and we would see that x equals 33 degrees and so that would be our answer x equals 33 degrees let's do another one look at practice problem B we see that we have two line segments that are intersecting here and so we know that vertical angles are equal in intersecting lines or line segments so that means opposite angles 55 is equal to X there so we can just say X equals 55 degrees and we can put our degree symbol there put a box around the answer I always like to put a box around the answer to identify where it is and then we need to find out what Y is well we can think of supplementary angles here we could add 55 and 2y together and set them equal to 180 because they are supplementary angles and so we could subtract 55 from both sides first using our additive property of equality and so we would end up with 2y is equal to 125 and then divide both sides by 2 that's using our multiplicative property of equality you can divide the same number by on both sides and you don't change the answer you just change the way it looks and so we would end up here with y and I'll write it over here to the left y is equal to 62.5 degrees and so those are our two answers Part C of this lesson is a review of absolute value. Let's just go ahead and do some practice problems to refresh our memory on what absolute value means. Now, practice problem C, I have the absolute value of 7. I want you to simplify that. And so what that means is think of a way to simplify within those two vertical bars. Those are the bars that we use to designate absolute value and we're taking the absolute value of negative 7. When we do that we are just concerned with the digit in there not the sign and so we would just say the answer is 7 and we always consider our answers to whatever is inside the absolute value bars as a positive answer so we would say the absolute value of negative 7 is a positive 7. Look at practice problem D I want you to simplify that 3 minus minus 5 or absolute value of minus 5 plus the absolute value of 0 well first let's go through and get rid of our absolute value signs anytime you have a problem with absolute value signs in it that's what you should try to do first is get rid of those and so we'll have 3 minus the absolute value of negative 5 is a positive 5 so we just write down a positive 5 and then plus the absolute value of 0 well, zero, that's neither a positive or a negative number, right? It's just zero. So we just say zero. Absolute value of zero is zero. And really, we don't even need to consider it in the problem. And then we can add the three and the negative five together, and we will get a negative two for an answer. Remember in algebra, when we add, we add algebraically, and we consider three minus five. Instead of thinking of it like that, we're, we think of adding a negative 5 to a 3. So whatever the number is on the inside of the absolute value symbol, we just simplify that to a positive solution. This is the last part in Lesson A on properties and definitions. And in Algebra 2, we'll be talking about these quite a bit, so it's good to distinguish between what a property is and what a definition is. Mathematics that's just the study of the behavior and relationship between numbers and there are some certain behaviors that numbers have that we can't just define them a certain way that's just the way they are for example addition that's a property 3 plus 5 we could write it like that or 5 plus 3 the order that we write those numbers in does not matter they still both would add up to 8 Multiplication works the same way. 2 times 6 or 6 times 12 or 6 times 2. 
both equal 12. It doesn't matter which way we write them or which order we put them in. Those are properties. Definitions are things that we've agreed on. Universally, it's an accepted way to do a certain mathematical relationship. And usually it's something to simplify in mathematics. For example, 3 times 3 times 3. That, if you wanted to simplify writing 3 times 3 times 3, you could just do 3 to the third power. Now, that's a definition. We have defined 3 times 3 times 3 to equal 3 to the third power. We could have said that 3 plus 3 plus 3 equals 3 to the third power. And when we see 3 to the third, we'd say, oh, we need to add 3 plus 3 plus 3. And so that answer would be equal to 9. But that's not right. That's not the definition. So that way, it's a universal definition. So in China, when somebody in China sees 3 to the third, they're not going to think add three numbers together. They're going to know that that's a universally accepted definition to mean 3 times 3 times 3. So some mathematical concepts are properties. Some are definitions. Let's do a couple of more practice problems. Understanding our properties and definitions. In E, we have negative 2 squared plus 3. And so a problem like this, what we would want to do first is get rid of that power. And so we have a negative out front. That means that we're saying the whole quantity there is negative. In other words, the part that I have highlighted there, the 2 squared, we would consider all of that negative, And we would make that into a 4 first. And so we would write negative 4 plus 3. And so now we can add those two numbers together. And that would equal a negative 1. And so that would be our answer. Let's do one more. Negative 3 squared plus a negative 2 to the third plus a negative 5 squared. We'll start by simplifying all of our terms that are to powers, which all of them are. So that 3 squared in negative 3 squared, we would simplify that first. We're saying that that quantity is negative when there's a negative out front like that. And so that highlighted part, do that first. And so that would give us a negative 9. And then we'll say plus a negative 2 cubed. And so now we're doing negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. And that would be a negative 8. And so we'll say plus a negative 8. And then the last one is plus a negative 5 squared. So when that negative is inside parentheses like that, that we're saying that number is negative. And so we do negative 5 times negative 5 is a positive 25. And so we'll just write down 25. And so in that negative 8 there, I put that in parentheses because there was a plus sign in front of it. And I just didn't want to get the plus and the minus confused there. And so we'll have a negative 9 plus a negative 8. I always try to add in pairs when I'm simplifying a long expression like this. Negative 9 plus a negative 8 would be negative 17. We write that down, add the 25. And so a negative 17 plus a 25, that would equal a positive 7. I'm sorry, a positive 8. So in reviewing problem F, this is import an important thing to remember. When you have a negative sign out front, like in front of that negative 3 squared, you do the 3 squared operation first. And then you put the negative back in front of it. If the negative is in parentheses, like on the 2 and the 5, there's a negative in front of it in parentheses. You're saying that number is negative, And you just multiply it out however many times according to the power that it's raised to. Okay, well, that's all for Lesson A.